the stove one they'll bring her said mrs trescott dubiously her cousin the painter the bewildered father of the angel child had written to say that if they were asked he and his wife would come to the trescotts for christmas holidays but he had not officially stated that the angel child would form part of the expedition but of course they'll bring her said mrs trescott to her husband the doctor assented yes they'll have to bring her they wouldn't dare leave new york at her mercy <sighs> sighed mrs trescott after a pause the neighbors will be pleased when they see her they'll immediately lock up their children for safety anyhow said trescott the devastation of the margate twins was complete she can't do that particular thing again i shall be interested to note what form her energy will take this time oh yes that's it cried the wife you'll be interested you've hit it exactly you'll be interested to know what form her energy will take this time and then when the real crisis comes you'll put on your hat and walk out of the house and leave me to straighten things out this is not a scientific question this is a practical matter well as a practical man i advocate chaining her out in the stable answered the doctor when jimmy trescott was told that his old flame was again to appear he remained calm in fact time had so mended his youthful heart that it was a regular apple of oblivion and peace her image in his thought was as the track of a bird on deep snow it was an impression but it did not concern the depths however he did what befitted his state he went out and bragged in the street my cousin is coming next week from new york my cousin is coming tomorrow from new york girl or boy said the populace bluntly but when enlightened they speedily cried oh we remember her they were charmed for they thought of her as an outlaw and they surmised that she could lead them into a very ecstasy of sin they thought of her as a brave bandit because they had been whipped for various pranks into which she had led them when jimmy made his declaration they fell into a state of pleased and shuddering expectancy mrs trescott pronounced her point of view the child is a nice child if only carolyn had some sense but she hasn't and willis is like a wax figure i don't see what can be done unless unless you simply go to willis and put the whole thing right at him then for purposes of indication she improvised a speech look here willis you've got a little daughter haven't you but confound it man she is not the only girl child ever brought into the sunlight there are a lot of children children are an ordinary phenomenon in china they drown girl babies if you wish to submit to this frightful impostor and tyrant that is all very well but why in the name of humanity do you make us submit to it dr trescott laughed i wouldn't dare say it to him anyhow said mrs trescott determinedly that is what you should say to him it wouldn't do the slightest good it would only make him very angry and i would lay myself perfectly open to a suggestion that i had better attend to my own affairs with more rigour well i suppose you are right mrs trescott again said why don't you speak to caroline asked the doctor humorously speak to caroline well i wouldn't for the world she'd fly through the roof she'd snap my head off speak to caroline you must be mad one afternoon the doctor went to await his visitors on the platform of the railway station he was thoughtfully smiling for some quaint reason he was convinced that he was to be treated to a quick manifestation of little cora's peculiar and interesting powers and yet when the train paused at the station there appeared to him only a pretty little girl in a fur-lined hood and with her nose reddening from the sudden cold and attended respectfully by her parents he smiled again reflecting that he had comically exaggerated the dangers of dear little cora it amused his philosophy to note that he had really been perturbed as the big sleigh sped homeward there was a sudden shrill outcry from the angel child oh mamma mamma they've forgotten my stove hush dear hush said the mother it's all right oh but mamma 
they've forgotten my stove. The doctor thrust his chin suddenly out of his top coat collar. Stove, he said. Stove? What stove? Oh, just a toy of the child's, explained the mother. She's grown so fond of it, she loves it so, that if we didn't take it everywhere with her, she'd suffer dreadfully. So we always bring it. Oh, said the doctor. He pictured a little tin trinket. But when the stove was really unmasked, it turned out to be an affair of cast iron, as big as a portmanteau, and, as the stage people say, practicable. There was some trouble that evening when came the hour of children's bedtime. Little Cora burst into a wild declaration that she could not retire for the night unless the stove was carried upstairs and placed at her bedside. While the mother was trying to dissuade the child, the Trescotts held their peace and gazed with awe. The incident closed when the lamb-eyed father gathered the stove in his arms and preceded the angel child to her chamber. In the morning, Trescott was standing with his back to the dining-room fire, awaiting breakfast, when he heard a noise of descending guests. Presently the door opened and the party entered in regular order. First came the angel child, then the cooing mother, and last the great painter with his arm full of the stove. He deposited it gently in a corner and sighed. Trescott wore a wide grin. "'What are you carting that thing all over the house for?' he said brutally. "'Why don't you put it in some place where she can play with it and leave it there?' The mother rebuked him with a look. "'Well, if it gives her pleasure, Ned,' she expostulated softly, "'if it makes the child happy to have the stove with her, why shouldn't she have it?' "'Just so,' said the doctor with calmness. "'Jimmy's idea was the roaring fireplace in the cabin of the lone mountaineer. "'At first he was not able to admire a girl's stove built on well-known domestic lines. "'He eyed it and thought it was very pretty, but it did not move him immediately. "'But a certain respect grew to an interest, and he became the angel child's accomplice, "'and even if he had not had an interest grow upon him, he was certain to have been implicated sooner or later, because of the imperious way of little Cora, who made a surf of him in a few swift sentences. Together they carried the stove out into the desolate garden and squatted it in the snow. Jimmy's snug little muscles had been pitted against the sheer nervous vigour of this little golden-haired girl, and he had not won great honours. When the mind blazed inside the small body, the angel child was pure force. She began to speak. Now, Jim, get some paper. Get some wood little sticks at first. Now we want a match. You got a match? We'll go get a match. Get some more wood. Hurry up now. No, no, I'll light it my own self. You get some more wood. There, isn't that splendid? You get a whole lot of wood and pile it up here by the stove. And now, what'll we cook? We must have something to cook, you know, else it ain't like the real. Potatoes, said Jimmy at once. The day was clear, cold, bright. An icy wind sped from over the waters of the lake. A grown person would hardly have been abroad, save on compulsion of a kind. And yet, when they were called to luncheon, the two little simpletons protested with great cries. 2. The ladies of Willemville were somewhat given to the pagan habit of tea parties. When a tea party was to befall a certain house, one could read it in the manner of the prospective hostess, who for some previous days would go about twitching this and twisting that, and dusting here and polishing there. The ordinary habits of the household began then to disagree with her, and her unfortunate husband and children fled to the lengths of their tethers. Then there was a hush. Then there was a tea party. On the fatal afternoon, a small picked company of latent enemies would meet. There would be a fanfare of affectionate greetings, during which everybody would measure to an inch the importance of what everybody else was wearing. Those who wore old dresses would wish then that they had not come, and those who saw that in the company they were well clad would be pleased or exalted, or filled with the joys of cruelty. Then they had tea, 
which was a habit and a delight with none of them, their usual beverage being coffee with milk. Usually the party jerked horribly in the beginning, while the hostess strove and pulled and pushed to make it progress smooth. Then suddenly it would be off like the wind, eight, fifteen, or twenty-five tongues clattering with a noise like a cotton mill combined with the noise of a few penny whistles. Then the hostess had nothing to do but to look glad and see that everybody had enough tea and cake. When the door was closed behind the last guest, the hostess would usually drop into a chair and say, "'Thank heaven! They're gone!' There would be no malice in this expression. It simply would be that, woman-like, she had flung herself headlong at the accomplishment of a pleasure which she could not even define, and at the end she felt only weariness. The value and beauty, or oddity, of the teacups was another element which entered largely into the spirit of these terrible enterprises. The quality of the tea was an element which did not enter at all. Uniformly it was rather bad. But the cups! Some of the more ambitious people aspired to have cups each of a different pattern, possessing, in fact, the sole similarity that with their odd curves and dips of form they each resembled anything but a teacup. Others of the more ambitious aspired to a quite severe and godly set, which, when viewed, appalled one with its austere and rigid family resemblances, and made one desire to ask the hostess if the teapot was not the father of all the little cups, and at the same time protesting gallantly that such a young and charming cream jug surely could not be their mother. But of course the serious part is that these collections so differed in style, and the obvious amount paid for them, that nobody could be happy. The poorer ones envied, the richer ones feared, the poorer ones continually striving to overtake the leaders, the leaders always with their heads turned back to hear overtaking footsteps. And none of these things here written did they know. Instead of seeing that they were very stupid, they thought they were very fine, and they gave and took heart bruises, fierce, deep heart bruises, under the clear impression that of such kind of rubbish was the kingdom of nice people. The characteristics of outsiders, of course, emerged in shreds from these tea parties, and it is doubtful if the characteristics of insiders escaped entirely. In fact, these tea parties were in the large way the result of a conspiracy of certain unenlightened people to make life still more uncomfortable. Mrs. Trescott was in the circle of tea fighters, largely through a sort of artificial necessity, a necessity, in short, which she had herself created in a spirit of femininity. When the painter and his family came for the holidays, Mrs. Trescott had for some time been feeling that it was her turn to give a tea party, and she was resolved upon it, now that she was reinforced by the beautiful wife of the painter, whose charms would make all the other women feel badly. And Mrs. Trescott further resolved that the affair should be notable in more than one way, the painter's wife suggested that, as an innovation, they give the people good tea. But Mrs. Trescott shook her head. She was quite sure they would not like it. It was an impressive gathering. A few came to see if they could not find out the faults of the painter's wife, and these, added to those who would have attended even without that attractive prospect, swelled the company to a number quite large for Willemville. There were the usual preliminary jolts, and then, suddenly, the tea-party was in full swing and looked like an unprecedented success. Mrs. Trescott exchanged a glance with the painter's wife. They felt proud and superior. This tea-party was almost perfection. Three. Jimmy and the angel child, after being oppressed by innumerable admonitions to behave correctly during the afternoon, succeeded in reaching the garden, where the stove awaited them. They were enjoying themselves grandly, when snow began to fall so heavily that it gradually dampened their ardor as well as extinguished the fire in the stove. They stood ruefully until the angel child devised the plan of carrying the stove into the stable, and there, safe from the storm, 
to continue the festivities. But they were met at the door of the stable by Peter Washington. "'What you bout, Jim?' "'Now, it's snowing so hard, we thought we'd take the stove into the stable.' "'And have her fire in it? No, sir. Go on, way from here. Go on. Don't allow no such foolishin' round yeah. No, sir.' "'Well, we ain't going to hurt your old stable, are we?' asked Jimmy, ironically. "'Dat you ain't, Jim. Not so long's I keep my two eyes right plumb square pinted at old Jim. <laughs> no, sir.' Peter began to chuckle in derision. The two vagabonds stood before him while he informed them of their iniquities as well as their absurdities, and further made clear his own masterly grasp of the spirit of their devices. Nothing affects children so much as rhetoric. It may not involve any definite presentation of common sense, but if it is picturesque, they surrender decently to its influence. Peter was by all means a rhetorician, and it was not long before the two children had dismally succumbed to him. They went away. Depositing the stove in the snow, they straightened to look at each other. It did not enter either head to relinquish the idea of continuing the game, but the situation seemed invulnerable. The angel child went on a scouting tour. Presently she returned, flying. I know. Let's have it in the cellar. In the cellar. Oh, it'll be lovely. The outer door of the cellar was open, and they proceeded down some steps with their treasure. There was plenty of light. The cellar was high-walled, warm, and dry. They named it an ideal place. Two huge cylindrical furnaces were humming away, one at either end. Overhead, the beams detonated with different emotions which agitated the tea party. Jimmy worked like a stoker, and soon there was a fine bright fire in the stove. The fuel was of small brittle sticks, which did not make a great deal of smoke. "'Now what'll we cook?' cried little Cora. "'What'll we cook, Jim? We must have something to cook, you know.' "'Potatoes?' said Jimmy. But the angel child made a scornful gesture. "'No! I've cooked about a million potatoes, I guess. Potatoes aren't nice any more.' Jimmy's mind was all said and done when the question of potatoes had been passed, and he looked weakly at his companion. "'Haven't you any turnips in your house?' she inquired contemptuously. "'In my house we have turnips.' "'Oh, turnips!' exclaimed Jimmy, immensely relieved to find that the honour of his family was safe. "'Turnips? Oh, bushels and bushels and bushels, out in the shed!' "'Well, go and get a whole lot,' commanded the angel child. "'Go and get a whole lot. Great big ones. We always have great big ones.' Jimmy went to the shed and kicked gently at a company of turnips, which the frost had amalgamated. He made three journeys to and from the cellar, carrying always the very largest types from his father's store. Four of them filled the oven of little Cora's stove. This fact did not please her, so they placed three rows of turnips on the hot top. Then the angel child, profoundly moved by an inspiration, suddenly cried out, "'Oh, Jimmy, let's play we're keeping a hotel, and have got to cook for about a thousand people, and those two furnaces will be the ovens, and I'll be the chief cook.' "'No, I want to be the chief cook some of the time,' interrupted Jimmy. "'No, I'll be chief cook my own self.' You must be my assistant. Now I'll prepare em, see? And then you put em in the ovens. Get the shovel. We'll play that's the pan. I'll fix em up and then you put em in the oven. Hold it still now. Jim held the coal shovel while little Cora, with a frown of importance, arranged turnips in rows upon it. She patted each one daintily and then backed away to view it with her head critically sideways. There! she shouted at last. That'll do, I guess. Put em in the oven. Jimmy marched with his shovel full of turnips to one of the furnaces. The door was already open, and he slid the shovel in upon the red coals. Come on, cried little Cora. I've got another batch nearly ready. But what am I going to do with these? asked Jimmy. There aren't only one shovel. Leave em in there, retorted the girl passionately. Leave em in there and then play you're coming with another pan. 
"'Tain't right to stand there and hold the pan, you goose.' So Jimmy expelled all his turnips from his shovel out upon the furnace fire, and returned obediently for another batch. "'These are puddings!' yelled the angel child gleefully. "'Dozens and dozens of puddings for the thousand people at our great big hotel!' Four. At the first alarm, the painter had fled to the doctor's office, where he hid his face behind a book and pretended that he did not hear the noise of feminine reveling. When the doctor came from a round of calls, he too retreated upon the office, and the men consoled each other as well as they were able. Once Mrs. Trescott dashed in to say delightedly that her tea party was not only the success of the season, but it was probably the very nicest tea party that had ever been held in Willemville. After vainly beseeching them to return with her, she dashed away again, her face bright with happiness. The doctor and the painter remained for a long time in silence, Trescott tapping reflectively upon the window pane. Finally he turned to the painter and, sniffing, said, "'What is that, Willis? Don't you smell something?' The painter also sniffed. "'Why, yes, it's like... it's like turnips.' "'Turnips? No, it can't be.' "'Well, it's very much like it.' The puzzled doctor opened the door into the hall, and at first it appeared that he was going to give back two pieces. A result of frizzling turnips, which was almost as tangible as mist, had blown in upon his face and made him gasp. "'Good God, Willis, what can this be?' he cried." Whee! said the painter. "'It's awful, isn't it?' The doctor made his way hurriedly to his wife, but before he could speak with her he had to endure the business of greeting a score of women. Then he whispered, "'Out in the hall there's an awful—' But at that moment it came to them on the wings of a sudden draught. The solemn odour of burning turnips rolled in like a sea-fog, and it fell upon that dainty, perfumed tea-party." It was almost a personality. If some unbidden and extremely odious guest had entered the room, the effect would have been much the same. The sprightly talk stopped with a jolt, and people looked at each other. Then a few brave and considerate persons made the usual attempts to talk away as if nothing had happened. They all looked at their hostess, who wore an air of stupefaction. The odour of burning turnips grew and grew, to Trescott it seemed to make a noise. He thought he could hear the dull roar of this outrage. Under some circumstances he might have been able to take the situation from a point of view of comedy. But the agony of his wife was too acute, and for him too visible. She was saying, "'Yes, we saw the play the last time we were in New York. I liked it very much, that scene in the second act. The gloomy church, you know, and all that. Uh, and the organ playing, and then—' when the four singing little girls came in but trescott comprehended that she did not know if she were talking of a play or a parachute he had not been in the room twenty seconds before his brow suddenly flushed with an angry inspiration he left the room hastily leaving behind him an incoherent phrase of apology and charged upon his office where he found the painter somnolent willis he cried sternly come with me it's that damn kid of yours the painter was immediately agitated. He always seemed to feel more than anyone else in the world the peculiar ability of his child to create resounding excitement, but he seemed always to exhibit the feelings very late. He arose hastily and hurried after Trescott to the top of the inside cellar stairway. Trescott motioned him to pause, and for an instant they listened. "'Hurry up, Jim!' cried the busy little Cora. "'Here's another whole batch of lovely puddings. "'Hurry up now and put them in the oven.' "'Trescott looked at the painter. "'The painter groaned. "'Then they appeared violently in the middle of the great kitchen of the hotel, "'with a thousand people in it. "'Jimmy, go upstairs,' said Trescott, "'and then he turned to watch the painter deal with the angel child. "'With some imitation of wrath, "'the painter stalked to his daughter's side and grasped her by the arm. "'Oh, Papa! Papa! Papa, she screamed, you're pinching me, you're pinching me, you're pinching me, Papa. At first the painter had seemed resolved to keep his grip, but suddenly he let go of her arm in a panic. 
I've heard her, he said, turning to Trescott. Trescott had swiftly done much towards the obliteration of the hotel kitchen, but he looked up now and spoke after a short period of reflection. You've heard her, have you? Well, hurt her again. Spank her, he cried enthusiastically. Spank her, confound you, man. She needs it. Here's your chance. Spank her and spank her good. Spank her. The painter naturally wavered over this incendiary proposition, but at last, in one supreme burst of daring, he shut his eyes and again grabbed his precious offspring. The spanking was lamentably the work of a perfect bungler. It couldn't have hurt at all, but the angel child raised to heaven a loud, clear soprano howl that expressed the last word in even medieval anguish. Soon the painter was aghast. "'Stop it, darling. I didn't mean... I didn't mean to... to hurt you so much, you know.' He danced nervously. Trescott sat on a box and devilishly smiled. But the pasture call of suffering motherhood came down to them, and a moment later a splendid apparition appeared on the cellar stairs. She understood the scene at a glance. "'Willis! What have you been doing?' Trescott sat on his box. The painter guiltily moved from foot to foot, and the angel child advanced to her mother with arms outstretched, making a piteous wail of amazed and pained pride that would have moved Peter the Great. Regardless of her frock, the panting mother knelt on the stone floor and took her child to her bosom, and looked then bitterly, scornfully, at the cowering father and husband. The painter, for his part, at once looked reproachfully at Trescott, as if to say, "'There, you see?' Trescott arose and extended his hands in a quiet but magnificent gesture of despair and weariness. He seemed about to say something classic, and quite instinctively they waited. The stillness was deep, and the wait was longer than a moment. "'Well,' he said, "'we can't live in the cellar. Let's go upstairs.'" End of The Stove